sort of. Hi everyone, I'm Bern Malnick, the university's chief wellness officer and dean of the College of Nursing. And I am very pleased to be able to talk with all of you about using cognitive behavioral skills building for prevention and management of stress, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. I'm going to first ask you a question, and that is, how many of you have tried to change the behavior of somebody you love? I think we all have tried that, but what do we know? Behavior change is what I call character building in others as well as ourselves. Most people don't change behavior unless crisis happens, their emotions are raised, and they change their thinking. So today I'm going to be focused on cognitive behavior skills building and helping you to change your thought processes when negative events or what we call antecedent events happen around you that you cannot control. It's important to understand, although we can't control negative events that happen to us, we can control our thinking. So this lecture focuses on how to change thinking so you feel emotionally better and act in healthy ways. So the objectives of this lecture, we're going to discuss cognitive behavior skills building and the evidence supporting it and highlight cognitive behavior skills building strategies and other resources for preventing and dealing with stress, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. Well, the evidence today tells us students, faculty, staff across the United States today are stressed, anxious, and depressed. One out of four individuals now have a mental health problem yet less than 25% receive any treatment at all. The people who do receive treatment, however, often do not receive evidence-based treatment. And that is treatment that we know works based on the best evidence from rigorous clinical trials. We also know that depression and stress are poor predictors of health, wellness, as well as academic outcomes. For years, studies have shown when students, whether you're baccalaureate, graduate, or doctoral students, when you are stressed or suffering from depression, you're not going to be able to fully engage in your studies and your academic outcomes will suffer. I'd like to review just some common symptoms of depressive and anxiety disorders because I would like you to monitor for symptoms, which are really important. So adults in particular with depressive problems experience sadness, fatigue, withdrawal, hopelessness, and it's important to keep in mind that hopelessness is the number one predictor of suicide. Loss of pleasure or interest in activities, a decrease or an increase in sleep, appetite, and concentration. Many people with depression or anxiety problems have frequent headaches or stomach aches. And a lot of people miss this, but when people are depressed or anxious, 
they often display it with anger and irritability. And that's why a lot of healthcare providers miss underlying depression and anxiety because people will present with anger and irritability, which often is a sign of depression or anxiety. A lot of people self-medicate when they have depression or anxiety. So drug and alcohol use is common, and a substantial portion of people with depression also have problems with anxiety. But the good news on that is that the best treatment for both anxiety and depressive symptoms is cognitive behavior therapy. Now, we live in Columbus, Ohio, and we see a lot of seasonal affective disorder because we have so many clouds, uh, especially during winter months. People with seasonal affective disorder, usually that depressed depression lifts during spring and summer when the weather gets nicer. Now, this disorder may be effectively treated with light therapy, but half of those people with seasonal affective disorder don't get better with just light therapy alone, and they often need to be placed on antidepressant medication, as well as get cognitive behavior therapy, which is the gold standard treatment for depression and anxiety. Many people get the blues, and I just want to emphasize what the key difference is between the blues versus true depression. With the blues, you feel sad or down, but the feelings pass in a few days, and they don't interfere with functioning, and that is key. Anytime you experience stress, anxiety, and or depressive symptoms, if they are interfering with functioning, that is a red flag that you really need to see somebody and really get a good evaluation. Remember, depression is a very common yet serious illness that interferes with normal functioning. Most people with depression need some kind of treatment to get better, and people do get better. There is hope, and we shouldn't be ashamed if we have issues with depression or anxiety and need help to deal with those. One problem with why so few people get treatment for a mental health issue is because of the stigma that still surrounds mental health issues. We honestly need to get over that because so many people throughout the course of their life deal with unsurmountable stress that they need some help during those periods and there is nothing to be shamed about for that. There are multiple causes of depression, and why I'm showing you this particular slide is because, although in many cases depression is genetic or it's multifactorial, you know, there are changes in chemistry within the brain, which is why antidepressant works for those people. However, there is a lot of people that experience depression because of the way that they think. Now, if a negative pattern of thinking is the cause for depression, that is why cognitive behavior therapy or cognitive behavior skills building is the best evidence-based treatment, particularly for mild to moderate depression or anxiety. You also want to see your provider if you're experiencing depression because there are some physical causes of depression or underlying physical conditions. If you have decreased hematocrit, you know, anemia, you could feel depressed. 
If you have hypothyroidism, you could feel depressed. So it's always important to get a good history, medical history and physical exam if you are experiencing these issues for the first time. Signs and symptoms of anxiety really are four in nature. They involve cognition, behavior, physiological symptoms, as well as what you feel, your subjective symptoms. A lot of folks who experience anxiety have forgetfulness, rumination, poor judgment, inability to concentrate. Sometimes you'll see behavioral signs like restless leg, anxious tapping, nail biting, but people with anxiety often experience physiological symptoms like fast heart rate, sweating, increased blood pressure, palpitations of the heart. You know, sometimes you feel like your heart's going to bound out of your chest. GI upset, stomach aches, and headaches. Lastly, subjectively, many people with anxiety experience irritability, helplessness, hopelessness, but anger is often a manifestation of anxiety. So, symptoms of stress, anxiety, or depression that are, again, interfering with your functioning need immediate attention and intervention. Please seek out help if you are experiencing symptoms of depression or anxiety or stress that are interfering with your ability to function. So there's been a lot of systematic reviews, meta-analyses, which are the strongest level of evidence to guide what we do on the fact that cognitive behavior therapy is the best gold standard evidence-based treatment for anxiety and depression. Cognitive behavior theory and therapy really came about from cognitive theories that were developed by Beck and Ellis and behavior theories developed by Skinner and Lewinson. Active components of cognitive behavior therapy include how to reduce your negative thoughts, and we call that cognitive restructuring, how to increase pleasurable activities, things that make you feel good, that's called behavioral activation, and improve assertiveness, so communication skills are important, as well as problem-solving skills. And in cognitive behavior therapy, homework is so key. Because remember, habits, including how we think, take time and practice to change. So the homework that we do in cognitive behavior therapy or skills building helps you to put the skills you are learning into practice. And practicing is, again, so key in order to develop a new pattern of thinking. So the basic premise of cognitive behavior therapy is that how a person thinks directly impacts how he or she feels and behaves. I want you to always remember this thinking, feeling, behaving triangle. Again, if we pre or reprogram our thoughts in a more positive way, we are going to feel better and behave in healthier ways. Now, there's also such a therapy called Mindfulness Integrated Cognitive Behavior Therapy. And research studies have shown this is more effective than plain 
cognitive behavior therapy because it prevents more relapse. You have to remember, if a person suffers from depression the first time and doesn't get active evidence-based treatment, the recurrence rate of depression is 60 to 70 percent. Now, mindfulness is a skill where we learn how to stay in the present moment. Those of you that have a dog, when you go outside to walk your dog, is there any doubt that your dog isn't in the present moment, right? Sniffing every bush that he can sniff, urinating on every bush that he sniffs. He's totally engaged in the present moment. If you are a worrier, or if you feel guilt because you're always feeling bad about things that happened in the past, you are not staying in the present moment. I always tell folks I work with as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, when you stay in the present moment, you're going to have so much less worry, so much less guilt. I was raised Catholic, so I know what it's like to feel guilty about everything. But again, guilt about what's happened in the past, worry about what's going to happen in the future are the two most wasted emotions. If you can learn to stay in the present moment, you're going to have much less stress, anxiety, and depression because you're beating yourself up over things that happened in the past. So I always help people to live in day-tight compartments, especially when you're going to school and or trying to work and you're juggling multiple things again, you're worrying, you're thinking about everything on your plate instead of taking one bite of the chocolate elephant at a time, just staying focused on what's in front of you at that very moment. So there's a couple of exercises that you can do that'll help you to stay in the present moment. If you put a piece of gum in your mouth and chew it, I want you to count how many chews it takes to lose its flavor. When you're doing that, you can't be worrying about what's going to come into the future. You can't be beating yourself up about what's happened in the past. Another exercise is bouncing a ball. Bounce it 50 times and count it along the course of the way. There's another book I'd like you to pick up if you haven't read it. It's called The Present by Dr. Spencer Johnson. He's a physician. He tells a story about this little boy who meets this wiser old man. And the man talks to him about this wonderful present. The little boy assumes it's a material gift and spends his whole life looking for this gift. In the end, he finds out the best lesson in life is living in the present moment. It truly is an easy read. It'll take you about an hour and a half to read it. A great, great story. So in Cognitive Behavior Skills Building, we teach the ABCs. So here's what I want you to practice on a daily basis for the next 30 days. I want you to make it your mission to remember the ABCs. So the A stands for antecedent or activating event. That is when an event happens around you that causes you to have a negative belief. Again, we can't stop activating events, but we can stop our negative thinking when an activator event happens. For example, you get a D or you get a C 
on an exam that you just took. That would be an activator event that caused you to have a negative thought like, I'm really stupid. I'm never going to be good at this subject. What I want you to do is stop that negative thought immediately, turn it around to a positive thought. Because if you say to yourself, I'm stupid, I'm never going to get this, I'm never going to be good at this, you're going to feel bad as a result of that type of negative thinking. So I want you to stop that thought, turn it around to something more positive, such as, okay, I flubbed up on this one exam, but it's only one during the entire course of this particular semester. I'll do better next time. So when we replace a negative belief with a positive thought, there are more positive emotions and behaviors that come as a result. And that's the C in the ABCs the consequence of that belief. So I'd like you, after this lecture, to write down an example of your own automatic negative thoughts. In fact, if you have habituated with negative thinking, you probably don't even realize that you do that type of thinking. So I want you to think back to a recent time where you felt depressed, angry, really stressed. What was the trigger? Because we can't usually control those activators. What was your automatic thought that followed? How did you feel? And then how did you behave? Lastly, how could you have stopped the negative thought and turned it around? to feel better. Catching those automatic negative beliefs are what's really important. So next time when you notice your mood has changed or intensified, or it's going in a negative direction, or you're feeling bodily sensations that are linked to your negative emotions, ask yourself, what was just going through my mind? And if it's a negative belief or thought, I want you to stop it, turn it around, so you'll feel better. Sounds simple, but it isn't easy. Especially, again, if you have habituated into a negative pattern of thinking. So again, the next 30 days, I really want you to try hard to monitor your pattern of thinking, especially when activator events happen around you that cause you to have a negative thought. I want you to turn the negative thought around so you feel better and behave in healthier ways. Now, when that negative thought happens, you, you want to activate some thought-stopping skills. Visualize a stop sign as soon as the negative thought comes into your brain. Wear a rubber band if you need to on your wrist and snap it when you have a negative thought. Or... Visualize watching the negative image on TV and change the channel. Lastly, use imagery to switch to a pleasant image instead of anticipating what awful thing is going to happen. A lot of people, even as adults, have never learned good problem-solving skills. And I always teach people the four-step problem-solving process. Ask yourself, what is the problem? Second step, identify what are the possible causes of the problem. Do not focus 
on those for long periods of time. Just identify the possible causes, but go right to step three. What are two to three solutions to this problem? And what are the consequences to each of those solutions? After you outline those, pick the best one and then immediately do something about it. Act on it. So tonight, I want you to sit down and write out three situations in the past few days of how your thinking negatively affected how you felt and how you behave. Then write down. Now this writing it down is critical. You've got to put this into real practice. So write down how you could have changed your thinking to feel better and act differently. Then I also want you to write down what are some of the stressful situations you've had this week? What things did you do to decrease your stress? And what could you have done to better deal with your stress? It's imperative that we work on the ABCs, monitoring for the activating events that cause a negative belief or thought, stopping that thought, turning it around to be more positive so that we feel better and behave in healthier ways, which are the consequences of more positive thinking. I'd also like you to establish a goal setting and self-monitoring log. It's imperative that we program our brains to think positively. One of the best ways to do that is to get an index card, write down two positive self-statements, put it where you brush your teeth in the morning and at night, and repeat those statements at least 10 times in the morning and 10 times at night. And then rate your emotions on a daily and then weekly basis. You will get an idea if you're monitoring your emotions on a daily or weekly basis of how your cognitive behavior skills building strategies are working for you. So I want to finish this lecture with some key strategies for both preventing and dealing with stress, anxiety, and depression. Research has shown over and over again that engagement in physical activity at least 30 minutes five days a week is not only great to build your physical health, but it's also great for your mental health. Believe me, I know what it's like to be a student, work, have children, and it's easy to say, let's push aside doing good self-care. But what do they say when you get on an airplane? Put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then give it to your children. It's critical we do good self-care and we make time for physical activity and eating healthy, light and often. When we get stressed and anxious, a lot of people like to load up on carbs, the junk foods, but two hours later they're crashing and feeling worse. So it's important we eat healthy light and often like a baby. Break your routine if rutted. So many times people get depressed because they do the same thing every single day. Break the routine. Do something different. Go out for a walk. Clear your head a little bit. And we all wish we had more time. However, instead of having more time, it's most important to have more energy. 
The way you have better energy is to build in frequent recovery breaks throughout the day. I know what it's like to be a student, and I was the worst at this because I could sit for 16 hours solid and keep pounding, working harder, trying to work through it. But I was much less effective than when I learned I need to get up at least every 50 minutes, take a break, move, get up and walk, get some fresh air. Our gluteus maximus is the biggest muscle in our body. When we sit more than three hours a day, we increase our cardiovascular risk by 30%. And when we sit, the brain drain, the blood drains from our brain to our bum, and we're much less alert and engaged. So make it a routine habit to sit less and stand more. I talked about the book, which is awesome, to stay in the present moment. Research has also shown seven hours of sleep is critical for everybody. If we're not sleeping seven hours a night and we are stressed, our body is putting out a lot of cortisol and epinephrine. And those are two substances that have a lot of adverse effects, not only on our body, but our, on our ability to think and to function. Keep practicing your cognitive behavioral skills because again, how you think affects how you feel and how you behave. Guided imagery is very helpful, especially after or before you go to sleep at night. And balancing work and personal life. Taking some time to spend with your family to enjoy things you like to do. I've made it a habit to get up every morning and read five to 10 minutes in a positive book. Again, it helps your thinking to stay positive. It creates a shield to negativity that happens to us every day. A lot of people say, Byrne, I don't have time to do this every morning. And I say, sure you do. You go to the bathroom every morning, put a positive book in front of the toilet, read five minutes, good stuff going in, bad stuff coming out. If you haven't had your vitamin D level checked yet, I'd really encourage you to do that. Not only are low levels of vitamin D linked to overweight and obesity, but also to depression. And because we live in an area where we don't get much sun, that level of vitamin D is really important. Take time to socialize, a little time, with family and friends. And if you can build in a habit of appreciating what you have every day, having an attitude of gratitude, writing down your blessings, you're going to feel a lot, lot better. People who have attitudes of gratitude feel emotionally a lot better and have healthier outlooks. We can all find a couple of things that we are grateful for. I always tell people, too, to say to themselves, I'm too blessed to be stressed when you are feeling stressed. Then, as soon as you feel yourself getting stressed, research has shown if you can take five big, deep breaths, stop and take five big, deep breaths when you feel early symptoms of stress is really important. When I take the deep breaths on inspiration, I say, I am calm. On expiration, I say, I'm blowing all the stress out. And I say that repeatedly. What the mind conceives and believes it can achieve. Again, 
The mind is powerful in how we think. Make a plan for how to deal with your problems and stress and talk to somebody you trust about how you feel. Lastly, see the cup half full instead of half empty. Know your limits. I work at this all the time. Saying no, that comes very character building for me. But don't feel guilty about saying no. It will relieve stress that you're not so overcommitted. And lastly, you've got to stay aligned with your dreams and your passions. If you keep your dreams bigger than your fears or your uncertainties, you're going to feel less stressed. So when you're having a real character building time, that's what I like to call it. Instead of I'm having a bad time, I'm having a character building time. Get your dream in front of you again. Visualize crossing that stage, getting your diploma. Visualize yourself making a positive impact in whatever you want to do in your community with other people. But keep the dream alive. Too often we let people steal our dreams. If I were your fairy godmother and I asked you this one key question. What are you going to do in the next two, three, five years if you know you can't fail? And then continue to dream it. Put those dreams in front of you every day. But dreams without execution won't lead to outcomes. So you got to dream it. You got to believe it. You got to risk take and persist through the character builders until the dream comes to fruition. Lastly, remember, seek help. If your symptoms persist, if you get anxious, stressed, or depressed, if they're persisting more than two weeks and they're interfering with your functioning, please seek help. There is help. There is hope. Depression and anxiety are very treatable, so do get help. Based on the best evidence, we know if you can just engage in these four behaviors, healthy lifestyle behaviors, you will have less heart disease, less diabetes, less depression, and less stress. Physical activity. 30 minutes, that could be three 10-minute walks a day, five days a week. Healthy eating, at least five fruits and vegetables a day. Don't smoke. And I put this out very cautiously because if you're 21 and older and you do drink on occasion, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, recommend one drink a day only for women, two for men. We have so much binge drinking, especially in college students. Five drinks at a time. A lot of that is because students are stressed and they're anxious. So if you put the knowledge that I've given you today about cognitive behavior skills building and the ABCs into practice, you also will have less stress, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. Know your resources. We have tons of resources for you at Ohio State. We've got a great student wellness center. We have a great counseling and consultative service center. If you feel suicidal or feel like you're going to hurt yourself because of depressive symptoms, you need to get help right away. And I've listed the National Suicide Prevention Line or go to the nearest ED. However, we don't want you to ever get to that point, which is why it's important to, again, put into practice the skills I'm teaching you today, because prevention and mental health promotion is key. This last slide 
I love because it's a painting that I bought about four years ago. And you can see it's a little bunny in front of a big bundle of carrots saying, dream big. We have to keep dreaming big, but we also, to not get overwhelmed, have to take one bite of the bundle of carrots at a time. So keep dreaming big, believing, persisting through the character builders, and using using the cognitive behavior skills that I've taught you today. Go Bucks!